So this morning, what I'm going to be preaching about, of course, is uh, we've got Thanksgiving coming up and I'm going to be preaching about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is actually one of my favorite holidays. I think it's a great holiday that we have. And I think it's a very, very biblical holiday, even though it's not established in the Bible as being a specific day or a specific holiday that you set aside to um, give thanks and everything. But it's very, very biblical in nature. And that's one of the reasons why I love my, my favorite holidays are the ones that have to do with the Bible. I love Christmas. I love Easter. And, you know, I'm not going to get into all the other stuff that people talk about, pagan backgrounds. Stuff. I love celebrating the birth of Christ. I love celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ was born into this world, the man Jesus Christ. I, I love that, and I love celebrating that. I love the fact that he rose again from the dead. And I'm glad that we take time out of the year, every single year, to celebrate those things. That's what I love about those holidays. And what I love about Thanksgiving is how biblical and scriptural it is, and um, what it ought to be, at least. It's not always what it is in practice. But this is what we want to strive for. This is what we want to focus on. And I want to help you to be focused on the right things this year. It's easy to get distracted with, with the, the anxiety or the stress that comes along with having a big day. Maybe you're having people, hosting people at your house and getting people together. It can be very stressful. But I don't want any, no one should get overwhelmed and miss the whole point and miss the big picture of what Thanksgiving is all about. It's not about the preparation of the food. It's not about having everything in order. And if there's something that's not clean or straightened up, then the whole day is ruined. You're missing the point. <laughs> Thanksgiving is about being thankful for all that the Lord has blessed you with. And this concept of being thankful, we're going to go over this and make sure, because this isn't something that you need to be just on one day a year, is having a thankful attitude. Okay, we need to have this this ingrained in us every single day we ought to be thankful and not become spoiled little rotten brats like we see in the story here with the children of Israel and we're going to go into this story a little bit more I think sometimes we could understand how we're supposed to act and how we're supposed to behave when we look at examples of how you're not supposed to act and how and what's completely wrong we can learn what's right from looking at the opposite so the opposite of thankfulness is what ungratefulness complaining murmuring and that's what we see a lot of that in this story and to be honest with you in a country that we live in today that has been so extremely blessed in overabundance it is so much the more important that we have the right attitude and the right spirit and we don't gain this entitlement sensibility of we just deserve all of this stuff because we're so great and that we keep ourselves humble if you were here last week you remember I preached on pride and how devastating that sin is and how toxic it is and if you can get this down about being thankful that's going to keep you from getting proud because it's the proud person that's not thankful for what they have because they think they got everything themselves and that it's all by their own power just being thankful for something implies that you are demonstrating that someone else did something for you that you didn't get on your own that's what being thankful is. You're, you're, you're demonstrating that, hey, I didn't do this, so I'm going to show thanks to this person who helped me or this person who did something to me or this, you know, or God who gave me everything, who gave me the abilities who have, who gave me the opportunities to do the things that I do or to have whatever it is that I possess. My family, my, my shelter, my food, my clothing, whatever, whatever these things are that God has blessed you with just showing that we are giving regard to the Most High and anyone else around us that has helped us along the way and being thankful for that and being very appreciative for what we have. But what we see here is the children of Israel. Now, they're wandering in the wilderness due to their own faults, due to their own sin, due to their own lack of faith in the Lord to bring them into the Promised Land. But God still takes care of them. God still loves them. God's still trying to teach them. God's still working with them. And he provides them manna in the wilderness, which is something the Bible calls it angel's food. It's something that man has never seen before. They've never experienced before. God's going to lead them around. 
and they have no means of feeding themselves because they're wandering around. They're not even really settling down. They're just going wherever the Lord says, okay, now we're going over here. And the glory of the Lord's going to shine in the tabernacle. And then he's going to depart and they're going to follow where the Lord wants them to go. That's what he wants them to do. He's training them to follow him in the wilderness, in the dark world, and just follow wherever the Lord goes. That's where we need to be and to trust him to take care of you. And he follows through every single time. And the way he followed through in this example is with man, he fed them. So you don't have to worry about making sure you have food. You don't have to worry about growing crops and harvesting them and doing all that work while you're wandering around here and I'm leading you through the wilderness. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to take care of you. And he does. And he does so in a miraculous way by providing food for them that no one has ever seen before that and no one has ever seen since. It was a very short period of time, 40 years in the grand scheme of things, that, that men ate manna on this earth, and now it ceased. It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. And God did all that to take care of them. Now, he did it in such a way where they had to rely on him every single day. He didn't allow them to store it up. He didn't allow them to put it, you know, stock it up and stockpile and make sure you had enough for weeks or months or whatever. He made it so that it would go bad. Within a day, I'm giving you your daily bread, just like Jesus said in the, you know, in the Lord's Prayer. Part of the prayer, Jesus taught people to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Let's ask God what we need for this day. And then tomorrow we can ask God again, give us our daily bread, Lord, and rely on him every single day. And that's what God did. He says, OK, you've got manna for today. You've got food for today. Do what I'm telling you to do. And then tomorrow. You worry about tomorrow then. And he says, tomorrow, I'm providing food for you again. Do what I have for you to do. And if they, if they kept it, it would breed worms, it would stink, it would go bad. So they had to rely on him. Now, at first, they were all ecstatic. This was great. God's providing. What, what more can you ask for than to walk outside your front door and just pick up the food that God has just blessed you with that's right there in front of you. The Bible says that the dew would fall like you know, on the grass, on the plant, just all the dew would be on everything outside. And then after that, the manna would come down and kind of join with that dew and just you'd have this food. So if you're hungry, when you get up in the morning, you want to go out and eat, you just go and collect that manna that's right outside of your house that, that has this replenishment every single day. You don't have to go further and further and further out to go and collect it because you've already collected that area. It's just right there. It's right there for you. What an amazing thing. What, I mean, how awesome would that be to have today? But what happened with the children of Israel? It got old. They got used to it. It became the norm. It became just, oh yeah, of course we're going to eat manna tomorrow. Of course it's going to be there. Of course it's right for us. And then it becomes to the point to after that, I'm getting kind of sick of this. I need more variety. I want to eat something else. And the Bible says here in this chapter, they, they ground it with a mortar. They baked it with cake. They did all kinds of different preparation with this food. I mean, it doesn't sound like it was really that bad that you're always just eating the same style, there's one thing all the time, but they had different ways of preparing it to make it a little bit better. And, and that's great, you know, but you know what? Even if they didn't have that, you still need to be thankful for God providing for you and you don't even have to do any of the work. You just have to go and collect it and eat it. Like, where, where is your gratitude? You know where the gratitude comes in is when you start starving. When you don't have anything and then you're given something, then people are all of a sudden real grateful. But when it just becomes secondhand, of course, we're going to have this. That's when people become grateful. And that's why we need to be concerned all the more about this today. Because as far as I know, nobody here is, is starving. No one in this room is starving. You're not going from day to day wondering, man, I don't know if I have enough to eat. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to survive. No one has that problem. And the problem that we do have, though, is we could get so used to it, we just expect to have more and more and more. And it can actually feed into our lust, into desiring more and more and more than what we really need. Look at Numbers 11 here, verse number one. The Bible says, And when the people complained 
it displeased the Lord and the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. This is something that we all need to take to heart and probably a great verse to memorize. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. We'd be very careful not to have a complaining attitude or complaining heart. Or, oh, I can't believe this happened. Can you believe that? And just start complaining about the things that happen in your life. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be happy about bad events when they happen to you. But you better not just start complaining, with all, especially with all the blessings that you have. One little thing goes wrong, and what happens? Oh, man, I'm, I can't believe this. this. This shouldn't happen to me. Why does this happen to me? You know, and just a complaining attitude that's not a thankful attitude, a complaining attitude. It displeased the Lord so much, he actually literally killed people. He destroyed people. Because they were complaining over what God has done for them and not showing gratitude and not being grateful. Verse number two, the Bible says, And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was, was quenched. So they've got this fire going, just blasting out on the, on the outskirts of their camp because the people are complaining. And God's saying, okay, I'll show you. You're not going to be grateful for what I give you. I'll teach you a little lesson. And then it takes Moses to intercede for the people and pray to God, God, you know, <laughs> please stop. We get it. And then God will relent and the fire is quenched. Verse number three says, and he called the name of the place Tabra because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? So now the man is not enough. They're saying, oh, we need flesh. Now, now I want to eat some flesh. And they, they go and reminisce of Egypt. Verse number five, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Freely. Oh, I don't think you were very free when you were in Egypt. How quickly you forget the bad times and the bondage and the slavery that you're under in Egypt. And all you remember now is, oh man, the food was just so good. We could just eat fish whenever we wanted to. We could have all these spices. They bring up here the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Oh, we had it so good in Egypt. And now that we're following the Lord, you know, it's just so bad. We've got now all we have is this manna. And they despised the food that God was providing for them and started lusting after anything else, everything else, what they used to have when they were in slavery. Verse number six says, but now our soul is dried away. Oh, you poor people, you sound so bad. After God's freed you from a life of hardship and slavery and being beaten by your taskmasters and being worked to the bone and given unreasonable demands, now your soul is just dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Funny how not that long ago they were saying how great it was that God was providing for them. Now it just turns into disdain for what God has given them. Watch out for this attitude. This happens all the time. People get real excited about maybe it's a material thing, a material possession. You get a new car or a new house or something like that, and you're so excited. Wow, praise God. Thank you, God, for blessing us so much. Oh, man, this is awesome. This is great. And then it turns into, oh, well, it's only got this or it's only got that. And you start looking at other things and bigger and better things, and you get your heart, have a covetous heart on things that you don't have and now things that you want. And all of a sudden, what you had already previously thanked God for and were thankful for, now all of a sudden you're disdaining what God has blessed you with. People that don't have any vehicle or whatever and they finally get the means and they get a car, it's like, oh man, thank you, God. Thank you for, for providing this for me. This is going to be great. This is going to help me out a lot. And then all of a sudden it turns into, oh, well, this is just a piece of junk. This isn't that good. I wish I had that kind of car or that new car or whatever. Or I wish I had two cars. Right? And then you get two cars. And you're like, oh, thank God. Wow, this is great. We can finally afford this. And my wife could have one. And I can have one. You do this. And then all of a sudden it's just, oh, there's always something wrong with it. There's, you know, and you get this complaining attitude because you get used to having it instead of retaining a thankful attitude. And God hates that. 
And anyone who's a parent understands a little bit about how God feels. When you work hard, mom and dad, you work hard, you provide food, you make meals, and the kid goes, I don't like this. I don't want to eat this. And that complaining attitude, it ought not to be tolerated. If we're going to raise our kids right, it shouldn't be tolerated. God doesn't tolerate it. And we need to look in ourselves as well and make sure that we don't tolerate that from ourselves. The Bible says here, it describes what manna is in verses 7 and 8 and how it, it came about in verse number 9. Verse number 10 says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. So now God's getting really angry because he's just hearing these people complain about the food. Moses also was displeased, and Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? So now Moses is getting so upset that the people are just murmuring and complaining. And mind you, he's the one who's responsible. He's the leader over all the children of Israel. He's the one that's in charge, and they're all just complaining. He's got to hear it from all these people. Oh, all we have is this manna. Why can't we have any fleshy? You know, Moses, what did you get us into? How come you brought us out of Egypt, Moses? And everyone just looking at him and complaining to him. Moses can't take it anymore. And I'll tell you right now, when people have a murmuring, complaining, unthankful type of an attitude, it wears on everybody around you. It's not just you with a bitter heart that has your own unthankful and, and unhappy, unjoyful life. Because I'll tell you what, if you have an unthankful attitude, you're going to be miserable. That's why greedy people who always want more and nothing they have is ever good enough live miserable lives. They have no joy. They put on a perception that they're real happy because they have all this stuff, but inside they just want more and it's never good enough. And those things never fill, they never satisfy. When you, have, when you always want more and you can never be satisfied, you can never be content, you will be miserable. And then that misery then, you, you try to share that with everybody else around you. And when people start complaining, it will impact those around you. And it's, this is what happened with Moses to the point to where Moses wanted to die. It was so bad that the people complained so much. Moses literally, he wasn't just saying, Moses literally was ready to die saying, God, if you can't help me out with this, you've given me all these people. This is too much for me to take, God. And, and just, you know, if, if I've done anything good at all, please just take my life now and let me not see my wretchedness. He's saying, I know I shouldn't have this attitude, but I can't take this anymore. Just, just end it for me, please. Please don't let me have to deal with this anymore because it is too much. He says in verse number uh, 11, where we're reading there, And Moses said to the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all? He's like, I didn't bring these people forth but I'm still here in charge of everybody. Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? It's like they're little babies, but it's like I have millions of little babies. He said, I can't, am I supposed to just care for all these little babies and make sure they're all fed? And I can't do that. I shouldn't have to do that. Verse number 13, whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people, for they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may look at how bad their ungratefulness has gotten. It says they're weeping, they're crying unto him. Oh, we need flesh, Moses, help us. Can you do something? It's gotten that bad to the point where they're just so ungrateful for they, they've despised their food so much that they're literally weeping unto Moses. And Moses says to God in verse 14, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it's too heavy for me. He's just saying, this is too much. I can't do it. So God, first of all, and then look at verse 15. This is, this is where he was at. And if thou deal thus with me, and he's saying, if you're just going to make me bear all this people, then kill me. I pray thee out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, if I've done anything right, if I'm pleasing in your sight, God, just kill me now. I can't deal with this anymore. And let me not see my wretchedness. Now, of course, the Lord is very merciful. 
And he loves Moses and he helps Moses out. So first he deals with this problem. He says, OK, you're right, Moses. I'm going to help you out. And he gives him other people to unload all that weight that he has to bear of being responsible for all these people. He said, OK, you, you're, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you all these other people. They're going to you're going to distribute your um, tasks and what you need to do among these people to make it a little bit lighter. And he hears them and and. He gives him that, but then God also uses this opportunity for multiple purposes. And I, I, love, I love this story. It's a great story. God's might is demonstrated. God gives the people what they want, which is also another lesson. Be careful what you ask for, especially when you have a wrong heart and a wrong attitude, because God might actually give it to you, but it might turn into a curse more than a blessing. These people just cried and wept and moaned and complained about getting flesh. They get their flesh. God gives them exactly what they're complaining about. But it doesn't do them as good as they thought it was going to do. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 18 says, And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. She just made God angry. He's saying, Oh, really? You think I can't give you flesh to eat? You think I'm not powerful enough to do that? And you're going to start saying that Egypt was better? I'll show you. And God demonstrates his might and his power in a very miraculous way. Verse number 19 says, Ye shall not eat one day. He said, no, I'm not just going to give you flesh for a day. I'm not just going to whet your appetite and just give you what you want and, and let you enjoy it and just be done with it. He says, nope, it's not going to be one day. It's not going to be two days. It's not going to be five days. It's not going to be 10 days. It's not going to be 20 days. It's so an entire month. He said, you're going to eat this flesh for a month. You're going to eat this every single day until you get sick of it. It says in verse 20, but even a whole month until it come out at your nose. He's like, it's going to come out your nose. You're going to eat so much it's just going to come out your nose and you're going to hate it. The thing that you've been desiring and lusting after so much, I'm going to make you hate it. He says, and it'd it be loathsome unto you. That's what it means to be loathsome. It, they, they hate it. It's, it's something that they hate. Because that you have despised the Lord, which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? Now Moses hears this, and he's like, that's a lot of meat. <laughs> I mean, 30 days, enough to be coming out our noses? We got 600,000 footmen. He's like, what, what are we going to do? Do you want us to? And he starts, he's just thinking about this like, well, how are we going to do this, God? Do you want us to just kill all the animals that we have with us? He, he's logistically is trying to figure out how are you going to give us this meat, Lord? What are we going to do? Did, you know, there's not enough fish in the sea to, to give everybody the meat that we need here. And God answers Moses. He's like, oh, really? You think I can't do this? Verse number, let's just keep reading here. Verse number uh, 21. And Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. He's saying, Oh, you're going to doubt me? You wonder where it's going to come from? Just wait, I'll show you. You'll see whether or not I can do this thing. Jump down to verse number 31. It says, And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. You've got three feet tall of quails that God just brought in and dumped in the camp of the children of Israel. And it says, you start in the middle of camp, you go a day's journey. You start walking for a day in any direction. And you've got three feet high of quails just all over the place. So they get them, they're excited, they hang them up, they're getting them all prepared, right? They're, they're ecstatic about this. But talk about a miracle. I mean, God's still, God's able to do anything. And he demonstrates his power again. Like, you think I'm not giving you meat because I can't do it? No, God's fully capable of blessing you with whatever it is that he wants to bless you with. 
He could give you the meat if he wants you to have the meat. But sometimes we also have to realize that we can be withheld from things for our own benefit. You may not realize this, but the Bible teaches this as a truth, that having wealth and having riches isn't all it's cracked up to be. A lot of people will say, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to say, or whatever, you know, like, I've never had money. I've always been poor. Well, you know what? That's a good place to be spiritually. Because when you don't have a lot, that's going to help keep you humble. That's going to that's gonna help you to have a right heart of being thankful for what you get. It's going to help you not to get lifted up in pride, and it's going to keep you from destruction. The Bible says, um, destruction goeth before, uh, or pride goeth before destruction. And you can see that I'm not going to go through all the verses that teach that, but the scripture is very clear that there's definitely some things, you know, it's, it, it's easy to fall in a trap when you have a lot of riches. It's not all it's cracked up to be. It's not going to bring you the joy that you think it will. There's always something more that comes along with it. It's easy to look at someone else who's got that boat or has that vacation house or whatever and just, oh man, how great would that be? And you don't really consider everything else that goes along with it. And people don't really like, then you got to pay all the storage fees and then you got to pay all the maintenance and then you got to get all the gas and then you got to pay, you know, it's like, and, and, and people who have all this stuff, it's just, you know, they, they end up stressing out then because now they've got all these bills and they got to pay for all this stuff and now i got to work even more. And it's not all it's cracked up to be. And I'm not saying you're wicked if you have a boat or any of those things. That's not, that's not my point. What I'm saying is that you probably just don't, a lot of people just don't even realize how much those things really don't bring you as much joy and happiness as you think they might. And no matter what you have or whatever you don't have, the bottom line is be thankful for where God has you. God is fully capable of blessing you abundantly. We look at Job. Job, is a great, Job was blessed with all kinds of stuff, just physically. He had a lot of goods. He was, he was a wealthy man in this world. But Job didn't get lifted up with pride as a result of that. It wasn't a problem for Job. God took everything away from Job. All of it is gone. He lost it all. But he still had the attitude, hey, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's the attitude that we need to have. Just giving the credit and, okay, God gave me a lot of stuff. Great, I'm thankful for all this stuff. The, the Apostle Paul said, you know, whether I be abased or whether I bound, he's learned therewith to be content. Just be satisfied. You have a lot, you've got a little, be satisfied. Be thankful. But let's finish off this story here. So they've got all these quail round about. Verse number 32 says, And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten omers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth. So they finally, they get it, they, they're up all day, they're up all night, they're up all the next day. And right there, that's not quite as easy as just getting your manna every day that God's already prepared for you and it's right out your door. Nope, they're going, they're staying up, pulling all nighter, pulling all day. They're up for, you know, 36 hours just putting in all this effort for this flesh. And then they finally get it. They finally start eating it. It's between their teeth. It says, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. Wasn't all as cracked up to be now, was it? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So that's the example that we could learn from of how not to be. And a lot of great truths we could learn about being thankful. But now we're going to turn to a lot of passages in the New Testament that just tell us flat out that we ought to be thankful and that we ought to be content with the things that we have. And if you love God and you love his word and you believe that God's instruction is going to help you out and, and actually help you to have a good life and a better life here, then you ought to pay attention to this and apply this. And it's not just a story. We actually literally have commands from the Bible on how we ought to behave. Look at verse number 6 of 1 Timothy, chapter number 6. The Bible says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. 
and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. The Bible is saying being godly and being content, that is great gain. That is worth a lot. That has great value. That has way more value than how much gold or silver or dollars you have saved up and stored up in your bank or in your vault. Being content and godly has way more value than that. And he says here, you know what? You have food, you have clothing, you've got nothing to complain about. Nothing. And he didn't even say a house. Keep that in mind. You have food and you have clothing. Be content. Be satisfied. Don't go saying, oh, Lord, I just need this and I need more. And, and you're, this isn't enough for me to live. And, I, and this isn't good enough. And I can't believe I'm in this situation. You have food. You have clothing. Be satisfied with that. If God blesses you with more, great. Praise the Lord. And if he doesn't, praise the Lord, because you have food and you have clothing. And be content with that. And that's what God has promised to us. Many people need to get it through their head that this life is not about things. This life does not consist of things. That's not what's important. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that, in context, that's talking about food and clothing. He's saying, just, just follow me. <coughs> just obey me. You don't have to worry about the food and the clothing. He doesn't want us worrying about that. He knows that we have need of these things. He created us. He knows everything about us. He loves us. Think about how much you love. If you have children, how much you love your children. Do you want to see your kids going hungry? Of course not. You love them. You're going to provide for them. But you know what you want to see your kids doing? Obeying you, listening to you, receiving your instruction. Why? Because you know it's all for their benefit anyways, whether they like it or not. You love them. You know how much you love them. Whether they realize it or not, you know, if they realize it, it's going to be all the better for them. It'll probably be easier for them to receive that instruction. And when we want, if we want to receive the instruction from the Lord, we understand God does love you. He loves us. And these commands are good for us. And it's going to just make your life better. Better. It's going to make the afterlife better. If you can get this through your head and, and realize, hey, I'm just going to follow God's instruction and not lean on my own understanding. Let's keep reading here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 9. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, that does not mean that they that are going to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It says they that will. Will means they want. That's their desire. That is what they want. They want to be rich. The Bible says they fall. It doesn't say they might fall. It says, but they that will be rich fall. You want to be rich? You desire these things? Get ready for a fall. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. That's the end of having a covetous heart and wanting and desiring all these riches of this world. That is where it brings you every single time. Verse number 10, the most famous part of this passage, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's what we need to be focused on, not on the things of this world. The love of money, greed, covetousness is the root of all evil. All evil that happens, evil that happens to other people, is, it, it comes down and boils down to people's greed, their lusts, their desires, their wishes for things that they don't have, they can't have. And, and they look at that, and that causes people to do bad things unto others. Thefts, rapes, murders, anything evil coming upon people, that all is rooted in this covetous attitude, a greedy attitude. 
people who never have enough, can never just be content with what they have. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Just go back a little bit to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 17. The Bible says, Wherefore, Ephesians 5, 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk, with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, we're having Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday. It's a great time to celebrate and to have a feast and to have family and friends and spend time together and be thankful for what God has blessed you with. Be thankful with what you have, but don't use this time to just be indulgent and gluttonous and, you know, getting drunk, definitely. I mean, no Christian should be drinking alcohol of any kind anyways, but definitely not getting drunk. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Thanksgiving isn't a time for excess. You can celebrate and be thankful and show your thanks to God without going overboard and turning it into some glutton fest. Verse number 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We should be giving thanks always, not just one day of the year, always for all things. I don't, it doesn't matter where you are in your life right now or what has happened to you, you need to learn to take the time to be thankful for everything good that you have. And focus on those things. You know why the people who, who are greedy and covetous aren't happy? Because they're always focused on what they don't have. When you're focused on, on holes and voids and things you don't have, that's not going to make you very happy. When you could look around and say, wow, I've got a great family. I've got, I've, I ate food today. I've got warm clothing on. I've got a place to lay my head. That's just going to make you a lot more happy. It's great. I, I encourage everyone to, to, have, to try to get that type of an attitude because you will be so much happy. You just have joy in your life way more when you're not focused on what you don't have and you focus on what you do have and you can give thanks for it instead of getting lifted up with pride like Nebuchadnezzar, oh, look at all these things that I have. Look at what I've done. Look at what my mighty hand has done. No, look at what God's done. Because just like Nebuchadnezzar, he had to be brought really low and turned into a beast for him to realize, oh, maybe I should have been thankful for being lifted up to this position. Don't let yourself get lifted up. God will bring you low. Last place I'll have you turn... No. Two places. Colossians 3. We're almost done. Colossians 3. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just a few pages over. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, the things that you say or the things that you do, the actions that you do, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything you say, everything you do, He's saying, give all of your credit unto the Lord. Give thanks to him for everything. Hebrews 13, last passage. Turn to Hebrews 13. We're going to close on this passage. Hebrews 13, verse number 15. 
The Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Verse number 15 refers to the sacrifice of praise. That's what God wants from us. He's not looking for the great financial sacrifice as much as he's looking for the praise. So, you know, of course, as a church, we pass around an offering plate and people give money, you, you, you pay tithes to the Lord, you give offerings, whatever you do. Some people may choose to sacrifice of themselves and to give, you know, a lot of money or whatever as, as a sacrifice. And there's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But that's not the type of sacrifice that God is most concerned with. Because God doesn't really need the money to make things happen. God didn't need to slaughter all the animals of the children of Israel to rain down those quails and give them flesh to eat for a month. God can support and sustain the church or any, you know, everybody through whatever means he chooses to do. What really makes God happy and what God really likes to see a sacrifice is a sacrifice of you giving the fruit of your lips and giving praise unto the name of the Lord because that's coming from your heart. And when you can, with your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit, worship the Lord and give thanks in his name, that is what God really likes. That's the sacrifice he wants to see. Is that with such sacrifice, God is well pleased. Let's not forget on Thanksgiving Day to give thanksgiving and credit and honor where it's due. Let's not get so wrapped up in meeting with family and enjoying time together that we forget the Lord. It ought to be a time where you can say, hey, let's all stop for a minute. Let's all stop talking. Let's all stop doing what we're doing. Let's all recognize the Lord God in heaven who gives all things. And let's be thankful for what God has done for us. If that's not part of your tradition, I recommend making that a part of your tradition or something similar to that. Do something, say things to give sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. Definitely on Thanksgiving, but how about every day? Let's raise our kids to be thankful for what they have and not to turn out to be spoiled, rotten little brats that grow up to be these greedy, covetous, evil people that don't have any sympathy or empathy for other people and only care about themselves and turn into these narcissist little morons that, that don't care about anyone else but themselves. Because that's going to destroy the country. It's going to destroy the nation. You've got people just running around with that type of an attitude and can't be grateful and thankful for what God has blessed them with. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you, dear Lord, so much. I don't think we can thank you enough. Starting with our own salvation that we don't deserve and that we can't earn. Lord, we thank you so much for loving us enough to, to sacrificing your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for making it so easy that all we have to do is just put our trust in him. Lord, I thank you for that. We thank you for being in a country that we just hap just so happened by chance to be born where we've been born and to, to be blessed with the blessings that we have, dear God. And, and we know that these physical things, they're only temporary anyways. But we have so many conveniences and, and so much abundance, Lord. Help us not to get distracted with these things and carried about into just desiring and wanting all this stuff because it'll just destroy us. We thank you for what we have, Lord, and I pray that you would please help us all to remain humble and uh, grateful for what you bless us with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.